Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land with ILTV, have no worries. It's time for our new show this week in Israel where we'll give you the scoop on everything you need to know about the last seven days right from Tel Aviv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here to keep you informed. The United Nations General Assembly has just passed a resolution condemning Israel for using, quote, excessive, disproportionate and indiscriminate force during the recent clashes at the Gaza border. The assembly is now calling on UN Chief Antonio Guterres to recommend a so-called international protection mechanism for Palestinian territory. Israel and the United States are, of course, coming out against this vote, claiming the resolution shows clear support for Hamas. The nature of this resolution clearly demonstrates that politics is driving the day. It is totally one-sided. It makes not one mention of Hamas, who routinely initiates violence in Gaza. Such one-sided resolutions at the UN do nothing to advance peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Everyone recognizes that. But advancing peace is not the goal of this resolution. I suspect even my Turkish friends know the passage of this resolution won't change anything, but that it looks good for the people back home to think they're doing something. That is pure politics. A vote for this resolution is a vote for Hamas. More than 120 Palestinian protesters and militants have been killed by Israeli forces in a series of riots along the Gaza border since March 30th. Hamas officials have pushed for Palestinian protesters to breach the security fence and infiltrate Israel, all as part of the March of Return, a riot that coincided not only with Israeli Independence Day, but also with the movement of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Israel has defended its right to defend its border, saying that the IDF will take whatever measures are necessary to protect the Israeli people. At least 50 of the Palestinians killed in the riots have been identified as Hamas militants by the terror group itself. That's why Israel claims that those who support this latest UN resolution are essentially supporting Hamas. The U.S. attempted to amend the resolution with a paragraph that would have condemned violence by Hamas, but that move was struck down. Our amendment rightly condemns Hamas's indiscriminate firing of rockets into Israeli civilian communities. It accurately condemns the diversion of aid and resources from civilian needs into military infrastructure, including terror tunnels used to attack Israeli citizens. It justly expresses our grave concerns about damage done to border crossings that are hindering the delivery of desperately needed food and fuel to the people of Gaza. The UN General Assembly, as per usual, doesn't seem to be listening closely to Israel's concerns. The General Assembly passed the resolution with 120 votes in favor and 45 abstentions. The U.S., Israel, Australia, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, Nauru, Togo and the Solomon Islands were the only eight countries to oppose it. The draft resolution before the Assembly is intended to contribute to de-escalation of the volatile situation to deter violence against civilians and to promote consideration of measures to protect Palestinian civilians. This process begins with a request to the Secretary General to submit a report in this regard, including inter alia recommendations regarding an international protection mechanism. The resolution is non-binding, but it has asked the UN chief to report back within 60 days on ways to ensure the safety and well-being of the Palestinian people. Well, Palestinian protesters took to the streets of the West Bank last night not to speak out against the Jewish state, but rather to criticize PA President Mahmoud Abbas's sanctions on Gaza. Palestinian Authority police tried to stop the protest by banning them before they even began, but things didn't work out the way that they expected. Joining me now with more is ILTV's Aaron Porso. Aaron, what happened here? Well, as you can see, hundreds of protesters came out to Ramallah to call for Abbas to end financial sanctions against the Gaza Strip. 
In recent months, the Palestinian Authority has toughened up on measures against the Hamas-controlled strip in efforts to force Hamas to give up control, uh, you know, and they've decreased electricity payments to Israel. They have even gone as far as withholding full salaries to civil servants that the PA claims to have in Gaza. Palestinian police even responded to the protests last night, though, using tear gas, sound grenades, batons, and 10 people were also reportedly arrested. So this is interesting because we don't often see Palestinians so openly protesting against Abbas, especially regarding Gaza. And this is a second protest against Abbas's sanctions in a week. Now, the criticisms are usually against Israel. Just look at the UN's decision yesterday. Well, but that's the point. You know, you don't often see it openly, but it's definitely there. Polls taken just last year say that over two-thirds of the Palestinians across the West Bank and Gaza have lost faith in Abbas and the Palestinian Authority, and they want him to resign. They even call the PA a burden on its people. Moreover, the PA regularly silences any dissent. First, they tried to ban this protest, for example, then they came and violently shut it down. But, you know, this goes back years. There have been no real elections since Abbas assumed power in 2005. Abbas practically ignored the March of Return protests in Gaza. And websites featuring political rivals like Mohammed Dahlan uh, and, and Hamas are banned outright. So, so what did Abbas have to say about this protest then? Well, aside from having it shut down, he tried to divert the attention again to Israel and Hamas, but clearly the Palestinians aren't buying it, you know, that, that the PA is blameless. Israel and Egypt do maintain a blockade around the Strip, but Israel withdrew unilaterally in 2005 and only maintains the border for security concerns. All right, well, keep us updated on this story, and, and thanks for the report, Aaron. Thank you. Fire bombs from Gaza being flown over the border with kites have become a daily threat now. Officials estimate that around 741 acres of Israeli land have been torched by these Palestinian kite bombs over the last two months. Israeli firefighters just stomped out 17 separate brush fires in the area that were ignited by these kites. Where rockets have failed, these kite bombs have become a somewhat effective means of Palestinian terror lately. Though the resulting flames themselves haven't claimed any deaths, the damage to Israeli fields and crops is estimated to be in the millions of shekels. That being said, there have been some close calls. Just yesterday, children in an Israeli town near the Gaza border discovered a fallen kite with what appeared to be a small explosive device attached to it. Bomb experts were called to the scene and the device was neutralized. To date, there have been some 285 isolated kite bomb incidents, evidence of the growing tensions threatening to hurl Israel and Gaza into even more bloodshed. Israeli leaders are weighing a decision to authorize deadly force against Palestinians seen preparing or flying these deadly kites over the border. Others fear that this lethal response will only push the region to war or draw even more criticism against IDF policy. Meanwhile, not too far from the Gaza border, the children of Israel's city of Sterot are flying kites with an altogether different message. Sterot's mall has just hosted a therapeutic workshop to deal with the stress from these kite bomb attacks. Dozens of kids were given tools to design their own colorful kites bearing words of peace. Needless to say, these kids are setting by far the better example. Breaking developments in northern Israel just now, an 18-year-old woman has just been stabbed in what many believe is an attempted terror attack. The suspect, a Palestinian man from the West Bank, has just been arrested following a short chase in the city of Afula. Police have confirmed that the suspect was shot in the leg after fleeing the scene. Video footage of the arrest has already circulated on social media, and as of now, the young woman is still in serious condition at the hospital. She was stabbed in broad daylight on a public street in the city of Afula, and we've learned that she was stabbed multiple times in her upper body before collapsing in front of a coffee shop. Police have yet to formally declare this as a terror attack, but for many, the writing is already on the wall. And a clear sign that unrest in Gaza is now spilling over into the West Bank as well. Israeli security forces have just announced that they finally captured the Palestinian man suspected in the killing of IDF soldier Ronen Lubalski. Earlier this month, Lubalski's Duvdevan unit was conducting overnight raids in a Palestinian town in the West Bank when a suspect dropped a large stone slab on his head from above. Sergeant Lubalski sadly passed away after fighting for his life in the hospital. The Shin Bet has named the captured suspect as 32-year-old Islam Youssef Abu Hamid. After an intense manhunt, he was arrested in a Palestinian refugee camp near Ramallah sometime last week. The arrest has been under gag order from the public until today. Officials say that Hamid has a long history of terror-related activities. He apparently has several brothers who are members of Hamas. Hamid himself had served five years in an Israeli prison for work he'd done for Hamas as well. 
Meanwhile, the country is still reeling from an attempted terror attack earlier this week. 18-year-old Chuva Malka is still in serious, though stable, condition after being stabbed multiple times by a Palestinian man in Afula. The suspect was captured by officers after a short chase. Prime Minister Netanyahu has promised that justice will be served as quickly as possible. All right. It's pretty rare to see Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu offer a helping hand to the Iranian regime, but Netanyahu is doing exactly that, simply by pouring a glass of water. Netanyahu has just posted a Facebook video offering help to millions of Iranians who face an impending water crisis. And here's what he has to say. Today I'm going to make an unprecedented offer to Iran. It relates to water. The Iranian people are victims of a cruel and tyrannical regime that denies them vital water. Israel stands with the people of Iran, and that is why I want to help save countless Iranian lives. We will launch a Farsi website with detailed plans on how Iranians can recycle their wastewater. We will show how Iranian farmers can save their crops and feed their families. The Iranian regime shouts, death to Israel. In response, Israel shouts, life to the Iranian people. Israel's impressive water conservation efforts are a testament to its cutting-edge irrigation tech. This includes, of course, the renowned drip water system. Netanyahu claims Israel recycles almost 90% of its wastewater. Considering at least half of the country is desert, that's probably a necessity. Iran, of course, faces an entirely different slew of environmental challenges when it comes to its own water crisis. While topography in Israel is all over the map, from desert to rocky mountains, the Iranian landscape is dominated by high mountain slopes and steep basins. Climate is also extremely varied all over the country. For now, it's unclear whether or not Netanyahu's new Farsi website will adapt to those unique needs, or even whether or not an Iranian audience would be receptive to them. Netanyahu and Khomeini have been at odds for years, with Iran's supreme ruler calling for the destruction of the Jewish state. Tensions between Israel and Iran have exploded in the wake of President Donald Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA Iran nuclear deal. We even saw the single largest attack by Iran from Syria shortly after Trump's decision. This begs the question, why is Netanyahu offering a glass of water to the Iranian people now? Some say the move is well intended to foster a future friendship should the current regime collapse. Others worry that it's, at best, a PR stunt for the cameras, and a foreboding guise of an inevitable war on the horizon. Where politics have failed, it looks like Twitter may be the greatest hope for peace. Iran's leaders have just rallied thousands of citizens in an anti-Israel march for Quds Day. But some Iranians are rebelling against the regime in a truly beautiful way. They've organized a Twitter campaign under the hashtag WeStandWithIsrael, sending Israelis messages of love for all the world to see. Israel's foreign ministry says that the hashtag has already gone viral, hitting tens of thousands of tweets since last Friday. The campaign itself mirrors similar Israeli-led digital efforts to build bridges with the Iranian people. Some of them, like the Israel and Persian campaign, are even sponsored by the Israeli government. Iran's leaders have consistently promised to wipe Israel off the map and mobilize terror regimes around the region to do precisely that. But the people of Iran have often risen up against the regime's hateful oppression. Many also remember the era before the 1979 Islamic Revolution, when Iran and Israel were actually close allies. For these reasons and more, the current regime regularly blocks its citizens from certain social media sites. But if these incredible messages of hope, coexistence, and peace for the people of Israel mean anything, it's that love will always find a way. So if you want to see something that'll really make you smile, search for the hashtag WeStandWithIsrael and send a message back. Israeli police have just evicted the last of the demonstrators from 15 Jewish homes in the West Bank outpost of Netiv Havot. These clashes eventually became quite violent, and at this time, nine officers have been injured in the scuffle, and several of the picketers have actually been arrested. Now that the buildings have been cleared, the court-mandated demolition of these homes has already begun. This comes nearly two years after Israel's high courts ruled that the outpost had been built illegally on Palestinian-owned land. This demolition was originally set for March, but residents were given a three-month delay to relocate. The resistance seen yesterday, which saw over 2,000 Israeli troops dispatched in response to hundreds of protesters, was brutal to the very end. 
At the moment, the Israeli National Police have evacuated 14 houses out of the 15. This is the last evacuation that is taking place. In the area, there are hundreds of police officers that are working carefully and cautiously to make sure that there won't be any injuries. But at the same time, we're not taking any chances whatsoever and dealing with the situation in order to complete the evacuation this afternoon. After the first 14 homes were cleared with mostly passive resistance, hundreds of settler youths barricaded themselves in the final structure. Several were arrested for hurling debris at cops from the roof. They fortified their position with boulders and wire fencing. Police proceeded to force their way in and restrain each protester one by one. Though some of the police injuries were fairly minor, others required immediate medical care. The Defense Ministry has finally offered its recommendation for the future of ultra-Orthodox military conscription, and the clock is ticking here on this critical issue. The head of the United Torah Judaism Party has threatened to leave the coalition if a law is not passed in the next 10 days. And on top of that, the High Court has set its own deadline after dismissing the previous law as unconstitutional. ILTV's Aaron Porras is here now with the details. So Aaron, first off, what is the Defense Ministry proposing? Uh, so the proposal is basically to set a minimal annual goal for Haredi enlistment into the military. And basically they say uh, any, if, if that goal is not satisfied at least 95% of the way, then they'll sanction those offending yeshivas with annually incremental, uh, incrementally increasing amounts every year that they uh, fall short of that number. And what are the targets here? Uh, so basically the targets for 2018, the proposed targets are, are about 4,000. Uh, but that's that's supposed to increase little by little over the next decade, about 8% annually over the next three years, 65 over the next three after that, and then 5% annually for the last four. Now, how has the, you know, have the ultra-Orthodox party has been reacting to this? Um, so they haven't officially reacted uh, yet, but I can tell you that their long-standing position has been ideally no, no enforced conscription. They don't uh, you know, they have two other laws on the books right now that are not on the books that they're trying to propose mm -hmm. that would essentially redefine yeshiva studies as a national service and thereby bypassing military service uh, altogether. But, uh, but I don't, you know, I don't think that that sort of thing would ever really fly in the Knesset. The Knesset's made it very yeah. clear that they want equality under the law and that they don't believe set, mostly secular Jews enlisting in nobody else is equality. Well, that being said, are there going to be any exemptions under this specific proposal? Yeah, there, there will still be some. Uh, some of the exemptions uh, under the regular conscription law will still be mm -hmm. included. They'll be adopted, for example, not having to enlist in the military until 24 instead of the original 18. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, now we just need to see what happens with yeah. this bill. Um, they just have to fast track the bill to becoming a law. Otherwise, we're... We're going to be see, yeah. being, seeing some uh, coalition breakdowns uh, in the horizon. All right, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Nearly a quarter of a million people from near and far have just made this year's Tel Aviv Pride Parade a truly historic celebration. This was the city's 20th Pride Parade, and what started off as a modest gathering for LGBTQ rights back in 1998 has since exploded into the Middle East's single largest festivity for gay equality and free expression. After all, love is love. This year's record high numbers made Friday quite the party. Things kicked off with a massive parade through Tel Aviv, culminating in an all-out party on the beach. For as far as the eye could see were rainbow flags, colorful costumes, wild banners, and even wilder activities. But one of the day's highlights was undoubtedly a show from Israeli superstar Neta Belzilai herself, mere weeks after clinching the Eurovision title. Over the past several decades, the city of Tel Aviv has blossomed into a beacon of LGBTQ freedom in a part of the world where such freedom is still quite scarce. Strict religious nationalism in Muslim-majority Arab nations and sometimes even in Israel's own ultra-Orthodox communities sometimes turns even the topic of homosexuality into taboo. But this weekend's massive gathering is proof that love in all of its forms is the only thing that'll bring us together. Thousands of foreigners flew in just to be in Tel Aviv when the party got started. A day where Jews, Muslims, and Christians all stood proudly shoulder to shoulder. Uh, we're here celebrating ourselves, our bodies, our sexuality, our partnerships. Uh, everything is just, you know, uh, celebrating life. And up now, ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with the top five of the week. 
Israeli presence in Hollywood has become undeniably noticeable, with national superhero Gal Gadot grazing countless headlines as our very own Wonder Woman. She is not the only famous Israeli to be featured in A-list movies and shows. So, here are the top five most famous Israeli actors and actresses in Hollywood today. At number one is the very young, beautiful, and blue-eyed Odea Rush. Born and raised in the city of Haifa, the 21-year-old has been living in LA and is an unbelievably talented actress. Her first acting role was in the Disney's The Odd Life of Timothy Green, which later landed her roles in movies like The Giver and The Hunter's Prayer. At such a young age, she is quite literally just starting her career, and you can already tell she's going to be huge. Second up is Lior Raz, who stars and is a co-creator of the hit Israeli TV show Fauda. Other than the small fact that Netflix has commissioned two new shows from him, Raz is reportedly set to star in the upcoming Hollywood film Operation Finale. He's an actor, writer, director, and pretty much does it all, and I'm sure Hollywood is just getting started with him. Third up is Alona Butbul, both an actor and director. He's best known for his role in the American film Body of Lies, in which he played alongside Leonardo DiCaprio and Russell Crowe. And as if that wasn't enough for you, Butbul also appeared in the 2012 The Dark Knight Rises and co-starred in the film London Has Fallen alongside Gerard Butler. So you can safely say he's had his fair share of co-starring with the A-list actors. Lior Ashkenazi is fourth on our list, one of Israel's household names and winner of multiple Ophir Awards. The actor has had some huge roles in Israeli cinema. He's also starred in Yosef Seider's feature film Norman, as well as played Yitzhak Rabin in the movie Entebbe. He's one of those actors you know you've seen before but don't know his name, and now you do. Last but of course not least is the actress Ayelet Zur. Her Hollywood breakthrough came in 2005 in the movie Munich, a Steven Spielberg Oscar-nominated historical drama, as well as acted alongside Tom Hanks in the 2009 thriller Angels and Demons and in the hit Netflix drama Daredevil. So safe to say you've seen her in a movie or two. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you. That's it for this week's Roundup. Tune in next Friday for our next episode of This Week in Israel. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from Tel Aviv.